the conductor. The staff manning the station and working the ticket desk. They are all volunteers, and they number a staggering 600. The volunteers seen here are steam locomotive enthusiasts. They mingle with the passengers. Both the clients and workers are all smiles. This is the Puffing Billy Railway of Australia. Melbourne is Australia's second largest urban metropolis. The city is home to 3.7 million people. Architectural relics built during the British colonial period in the 19th century dot the city. The city also has the third largest tram system in the world. Approximately 40 kilometers east of Melbourne, we find the town of Belgrave. This small town has a population of 7,500. It is the starting point for the Puffing Billy Railway. This is Belgrave Station. It's almost 7 a.m. Preparations for the day's first departure are occurring. The daily inspection of the rails takes place. This is carried out thoroughly and is done every morning. The tracks are inspected for any irregularities down the whole path. Seen here is John Thompson, 65 years of age. He is in charge of today's inspection. Since he was 18 years old, he has been volunteering here. He now serves as chairperson of the Puffing Billy Preservation Society. I still do a regular day as guard, or not, not as regular as I used to. I used to be a regular fireman on the engine, and I still do the, the, this morning track patrol once a month, once or twice a month. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a wonderful thing to be involved with. It's, we get a, a great sense of satisfaction and achievement in, in keeping this wonderful little train running. In Belgrave Station, Puffing Billy's locomotive engine is being fired up. That's it. And then we'll be right. <laughs> This locomotive, number 6A, was built in 1901, making it the oldest in the Puffing Billy fleet. This was built in Australia, using the blueprints brought from the United States. The tracks are 762 millimeters in width, what is known as a narrow gauge. The train can take up to 35 tons, traveling at 25 kilometers per hour. There are six driving wheels, with a diameter of around one meter each. The passengers arrive. The Puffing Billy Railway aims to please and entertain its passengers. 
Even the Belgrave Station Terminal is a faithful replica of its original. Stamping the date on the handmade tickets is also reminiscent of the glory days of Puffing Billy. This clock indicates the next departure time for Puffing Billy. The volunteers are eager to give all passengers the best Puffing Billy experience. Yeah, it's a good hobby, but expensive. <laughs> yeah, very much. Cool. Hey, thank you. Good there you go. Enjoy your journey. Handling the tickets here okay. is 15 year old Rockwell. Okay. He attends school and yeah. devotes half of each month volunteering at the Puffing Billy Railway. My father's actually a driver up here, and so that sort of helps a bit, but I've just always liked trains. It's been a big hobby of mine since I was a little tacker. Yeah, I'll probably be a Puffing Billy volunteer until the day I die. It's just so much fun. Hello. 250,000 people visit the Puffing Billy Railway every year. They come from Melbourne as well as abroad. Alan Johnson, engine driver, is entertaining children until the train's departure. It's 10 a.m. Our steam locomotive rolls into action. It's time to depart. covers 24 kilometers of track. After leaving Belgrave, the steam locomotive will stop at Menzies Creek, Lakeside, and terminate at Jambrook. The two hours journey costs 30 Australian dollars one way. On the Puffing Billy Railway, you're allowed to sit on the window sills with your legs dangling out. This is a tradition that has been maintained since the train commenced service. Eucalyptus and fern surround us. The rich oxygen of the forest and the soothing greenery transports us to a more peaceful place where we can be in sensual contact with nature. The Puffing Billy Railway began service in 1900. Initially, it was designed to foster tourism to the area and transport goods. This was during the frontier times for the Melbourne area. The railway played a very significant role in the transportation of goods. 
However, as the city of Melbourne grew, the demand for railway transportation to outlying areas diminished. This made it difficult to run the railway profitably. In addition, a major landslide in 1953 damaged the rails. Puffing Billy Railway was slated to close. This is one of the most historic sites on the railway. And over here we have the original track. And this location is where there was a landslide in 1953. And the hillside came down and buried the track. And it was after that occasion that the line was officially closed. And uh, it was then that the Preservation Society was formed to rebuild it. The citizens of Belgrave brought forward an initiative to revive the railway. They did not want to see their beloved steam locomotives become a thing of the past. Started by citizens, soon local businesses and even the army joined in the effort to help rebuild the Puffing Billy Railway. The railway was resurrected in 1962. To this day, the Puffing Billy Railway Company is kept running and operational by the devotion of volunteers. The steam locomotive is about to reach the sightseeing highlight. long, 13 meter high bridge made of wood. Here is an archival photograph of the bridge. This century-old bridge is still in use today. This bridge is made from eucalyptus, which is renowned for its strength and durability. The bridge has been restored periodically over the years in order to maintain its functionality. Today, the bridge is designated as a cultural heritage piece of the state of Victoria. After the locomotive has passed, a trolley appears. This trolley follows the locomotive to ensure that soot or any flammable material from the chimney does not cause a forest fire. For a railway enthusiast, being an engine driver or a stoker who maintains the steam pressure levels of the locomotive are dream jobs. Jean Crows started working at the railway after being influenced by her son's enthusiasm. It was Alan Johnson's dream to be engine driver of a steam locomotive since he was a child. While volunteering at the railway, 
he obtained his engineer's license 30 years ago. Best job. Best job for me. <laughs> but you must like what you do. If you don't like what you do, it's a terrible job. Same for the volunteers. Everybody here wants to be here, and that's why they're here. They don't have to come here and... Uh, terrific. If you like steam engines, this is the place to be. One hour has passed since the train's departure from Belgrave. The train has arrived at the line's middle point, Lakeside Station. The lake in front of the station is known as Emerald Lake. A large park surrounds the lake and station. People visit to leisurely picnic and go swimming. <laughs> the locomotive takes a breather here too. The water supply for the engine must be replenished. It is another 40-minute journey from Lakeside to the final destination of Jembrook. The round trip to Jembrook runs only once a day. Vista has opened up to rolling hills and countryside. after departure, the steam locomotive has reached the end of the line at Jembrook. The four steam locomotives being used at the Puffing Billy Railway are the original ones that were used before the closure of the railway. They are all museum pieces, but have been brought back to life. The largest of the fleet is seen here. It is the model G42, manufactured in 1926 in the United Kingdom. It is a very unique design with engines located at the front and back. There is only one example of this steam locomotive in existence in Australia today. G42 was initially put away in a museum after its service to the original Puffing Billy Railway. However, it was revived and brought back to life by the enthusiasm of its volunteers.
The revival of G-42 was very difficult due to its structural complexity. It took over 20 years to bring it back to life. Here is the revived G-42. It is now the most popular of the Puffing Billy fleet of steam locomotives. It's a museum, a living museum of what used to run in, in 1900, and we're doing our best to preserve it and keep it going as part of the Victorian history and heritage. So. The Puffing Billy Railway also offers a dining car which serves lunch and dinner. Advance reservations are necessary. Here we find a volunteer singer, Louis Hesterman, who owns and operates a hotel in Belgrade. Also a musician, Louis penned this original tune in order to commemorate the centennial of the Puffing Billy Railway. I just love the idea of volunteers. We have a lot of, we couldn't live without volunteers in the, in the Dandenongs, you know? And we've got some terrific volunteers. When they come to work, they're not coming to work to get paid, they're coming to work to enjoy the railway. There are many applicants every year for volunteer positions to help out at the Puffing Billy Railway. by the passion of its volunteers and stoked by the satisfaction of its passengers, the Puffing Billy steam locomotives will continue to chug through the green and pleasant landscape of Australia for many years to come. A lone set of tracks runs through this forest. In the past, steam locomotives carrying gold commuted along them. 
the decrease in the amount of gold to mine led to the line becoming defunct for a while. But the people living along the train line rose up to revive it. I think the app locos mean a lot, particularly to the Lyle community, because a lot of the old timers, they were woken up in the morning by the sound of the steam train. They relied on it so much. In the year 2001, the community brought the train back into service as a sightseeing train, known as the West Coast Wilderness Railway. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. It's 9.30 a.m. And some tourists have gathered at Queenstown Station, the train's starting point. Oh, hello. Morning. Hello. Many Australians dream of riding on the Wilderness Railway at least once in their lifetime. My husband loves steam trains, and so um, to go on something like this on the old steam trains, because we both grew up with steam trains, and you don't see many of them around anymore. Absolute wonders, you know, with the scenery, yeah. I expect, I expect it to be beautiful. Yeah. Tasmania is an island located one hour by plane from Melbourne. It is the second oldest state in Australia. Tasmania has been loved for ages and has long been called Treasure Island. The air and water are among the purest in the world, and it has bountiful underground mineral resources. Unadulterated nature is this island's treasure. Western Tasmania is home to two extensive national parks, which have been designated as World Heritage Sites. The West Coast Wilderness Railway covers 35 kilometers. It connects the inland town of Queenstown with Strawn, a port town. There are two hours until the train departs, and the engine drivers have begun their preparations. The engine driver is Bob Smith. He is 50 years old. Bob's son, James, is 25 years old and works as the assistant driver. Six years have passed since they started working together as a team. can determine the condition of the train by listening to the sound of the steam. To finish off the preparations, Bob polishes the train. The train that currently runs on this track is a steam locomotive with three passenger cars called Mount Lyle. It was refurbished in 2001 and was originally built over 100 years ago.
The steam is produced by diesel rather than coal. The driving wheels are 100 centimeters in diameter. A coupling rod connects the two driving wheels. Queenstown has a population of 2,500. When it was a prosperous mining town, there were 8,000 people living here. Finally, our trip has started. Five minutes into our journey, it feels as if we have entered a primeval forest. On board, there is a guide who talks about Tasmania's nature and history. His name is Graham Tatnall, and he was born and raised in Queenstown. You know, I must have originally built this railway, folks, and they've done it all without explosives. All the cuttings that you're going to pass through today were taken out with a pick and a shovel and a wheelbarrow. A thousand wheelbarrow loads came out of all of my hand. The first stop is Lynchford Station. It is the former location of a gold mine. People can try panning for gold at this station. As you can get it all wet, a little bit of gold will sink to the bottom. If you are lucky, you can enjoy the feeling of excitement that the pioneers felt a long time ago. There was a gold rush during the middle of the 19th century. Pioneers built the Mount Lyle Railway to transport the gold and copper that they mined. Queenstown flourished from the mining of gold, which was carried by the railroad. In the 20th century, the amount of metal being mined dropped and roads were built. By 1963, the railway was considered ineffective and stopped operation. My dad was an original train driver and he, I learned a lot about from him what I wanted to actually drive these trains. But in 1963 when they closed, I was only a boy, started working at the mine. The steam train came back into use in 2001, 38 years after it had been abandoned. The passion of the local people moved the government and corporations to revive the Wilderness Railway as a sightseeing train. A little bit of gold has gone for the bottom now, folks. It's only about as big as a pinhead, so be very careful. You might lose it. I hope so, sir. 
tour guide Graham, engine driver Bob, and his son James were integral members of the group that fought for the restoration. Thirty minutes after departure, we reach Lynchford. The engine room is bathed in quiet intensity. Yeah, well, it's sort of what we call an undulated track from here. We sort of go up and down a bit all the way through to for about another four, four and a half kilometres. There is a 160 meter change in altitude during the climb from Lynchford Station to Rhinodina Station. It is the most treacherous part of the Wilderness Railway's journey. When the railway was revived, development was kept to a minimum in order to avoid destruction of nature. The tracks lie on a four meter wide path and it is prohibited to touch anything beyond its confines. No road was made for the purpose of the construction of the track and work was conducted with the utmost care. The manager of the worksite at the time was Eamon Seddon. What was interesting with the project is when we actually started the reconstruction, we really began to realize the problems the original pioneers who actually built this railway had over 100 years ago. One of the advantages of a railway is that we can take a large number of people through a very narrow corridor and not allow them to physically touch, but at the same time be very, very close to it. A special device was set to enable the train to climb this steep slope. There is a third rail between the two usual rails. It is a track called a rack rail. Between the driving wheels are two sets of cogs used for climbing up the rack rail. A man named Abt invented the system in Germany during the 19th century.
Bob shows off his skill as a driver on this slope. There are two levers called regulators that adjust the speed of the train wheels. One controls the driving wheels, and the other is for the rack rail cogs. Uh, we got to get the both drives in sequence to work up the hill. Um, because if they get out of sequence there, the logo surges and does not like form. In other words, one must manipulate two sets of axles simultaneously in order to make this train move. More steam than usual is required to get up this steep incline. James makes sure that the steam pressure does not decrease. Putting water and gasoline into the engine all at once increases the steam pressure. has started throwing sand into the boiler. The fine sand helps it to burn more efficiently by scraping off the soot collected inside the engine. We have arrived safely at the mountaintop station, Rhinodina. <laughs> Ty! Don't be silly. Get your hands down. All of the water in the tank has been used up. James caringly replenishes the water to the tank. Just beyond the station, on top of the mountain, waits a steep decline. Bob says that the most stressful part of the journey is the moment the train starts going down the slope. Before it picks up speed, he must determine whether there are any problems with the brakes or the cogs.
precipitous valley has come into view. It is called the King River Gorge. There is a distance of more than 200 meters between the train tracks and the base of the valley. arrived at Double Barrel, a station deep in the mountains. Double Barrel is an aboriginal phrase that means a place where rivers join and then disperse. There is an hour-long break for lunch at this station. after departing Queenstown, the sea comes into view. We have arrived at the final stop, the port town of Strawn. In the days of the gold rush, this is where gold that had been transported from Queenstown was loaded onto boats and shipped across to Melbourne. When the West Coast Wilderness Railway started running again, the people of Queenstown placed these words on the front of the steam engine. Labor omnia vincit. Labor conquers all things. This is the spirit of the pioneers of this area, reborn and revived in the West Coast Wilderness Railway. Imbued with the sentimental air of the good old days, the steam locomotive passes through the beautiful scenery of Tasmania.